All right, guys, welcome back to the Outdoor Channel. Today, we're looking at maintenance on your Mercury outboard motor, as well as some other general boat and trailer maintenance tips for you. So stay tuned. Well, for me, it's fall. It's that time of year. I live in the Northern Hemisphere in a place called Wisconsin, so my lakes up here freeze. And that means it's time for me to button her up and put her away for the season and get her ready for the next season. So this is a Lund 1875 crossover XS. And like I said, we're going to be doing mercury motor maintenance as well as some other general boat and trailer maintenance now what i have found having a few different mercuries over the years is the maintenance on these newer four strokes they're really about the same this one happens to be a 150 pro xs but previous to this i had a mercury 94 stroke and that family is 75 90 115 115 pro xs and what i learned other than the amount of oil that goes in the engine is slightly different uh, the steps are identical. So again, this is a 150 Pro XS. It may or may not be the specific engine you have, but depending on your motor, the, the steps aren't going to be any different. Every new Mercury, or we'll just say newish Mercury, they've been doing this for a few years, is going to have a placard that looks something like this. This one happens to be on the port side of the engine, and it's going to give you 100 hour or annual maintenance task for you to do or 300 hour every three year maintenance tasks there's a qr code here you can scan with your smartphone and it'll take you to a youtube channel not all that different from this one and there's some real basic but useful uh videos out there from mercury and uh, they'll you know give you some step-by-step -step instructions that you know you can follow as well some things about your rpm range here this is important if you're doing things with your props and you want to stay within a range Torque specifications on your plugs, we'll get to that in a little bit. And probably the, one of the most important things is what type of oil you're supposed to use, in this case, 10W30. There are other oil weights out there, so make sure you, you get the correct one for your specific engine. This is pretty much everything we're, we're gonna need for today. Uh, we saw from the placard we gotta change the oil, so I've got an oil filter, and we've got engine oil. Now I use Mercury Marine Oil. It's what's recommended from the manufacturer. I know everyone's gonna have their favorite oil and the reasons for their favorite oil. And we're gonna just table that for a little bit. Uh, I'm using Mercury Marine Oil. You're either gonna need six of these, it takes six quarts, or you can get a couple of gallons of oil, in which case you use one and a half of these, and you'll have a half gallon left over to use in something else or for your next oil change. Now, wait a second. Some of you are probably going Hey, Tommy, I see two different brands of oil. Why is that? Well, simple answer, uh, Mercury Marine Oil and Quicksilver Oil, they are identical. They're the exact same oil. They're both made by Mercury or made really for Mercury. This one's simply branded for OEM or dealers. So you go to your boat dealer, they have Mercury engines. They're probably going to have this on the shelf. This is branded for aftermarket. So you go to your places like Walmart, uh, you go to West Marine, you go to wherever your, <clears throat> pardon me, your supply is for your oil, they're probably gonna have that on the shelf. If you go to places like Bass Pro or Cabela's, uh, they are both a aftermarket and a Mercury dealer. So you may end up with both like I did here. So it's the same oil. Same company, just uh, two different brandings, and that's the reason why you have that on there. Lower gear lube, so we're gonna be doing that. We're gonna be talking about fuel today, so we've got a fuel filter and we've got some sea foam. We're going to be talking about spark plugs today, so I got my NGK plugs that are here. Some basic tools to do the oil change, so an oil pan, a funnel, uh, a hose, we'll talk about that in a little bit and a grease gun as we get into a few different lubrication points. Aside from this, all you're gonna need is some basic tools and probably a ratchet set and you can get started. I 
I find that the longest part of the process is draining the engine oil and draining the lower unit. So what I do is do those things at the same time. So to start that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise the motor up here. And uh, Mercury says to do that anyway. We are draining the engine oil because there's some oil that might be stuck in the sump that will drain out. And I will take the prop off there so I can get to the lower unit. We'll bring her back down and we'll start. All right, so taking off a prop is taking off a prop. Have your ratchet ready. And what I find is a little simple lock of wood like this, some leftover two by four. You can use it to brace it against your plate here and you can start to wrench that off. You should have a washer on there that keeps that prop nut in place. I find that just turning it moves that washer out of place. I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. And really, you, you want to take your prop off anyway because you should be inspecting your prop shaft and your seal and make sure that there's no fishing line or anything that's there that should not be there. There's your prop nut. Here's the washer and these little tabs here just sit on there so that this can't move when you go in reverse, it doesn't work its way out. Put that off to the side. This with your hub should slide out. Part of your hub there. And we have a thrust washer here. If this is really on here good, you may need to take a tool and get that off. Be gentle. You don't need to uh, hit it really hard or anything, but a little flathead will help you take that thrust washer off. Now, if you grease your prop up properly, it may be a little dirty. We can clean some of this up. And again, inspect your seal. Make sure there's no fishing line or anything else that shouldn't be there. While I still have this up, I'm going to show you how this works. I've got a good camera angle, and then I'll take it back down and show you how it actually works here. But this is your drain here. There's a flathead. Uh, point here you can loosen it with or a 10 millimeter socket right down in there we're going to want to do that one first and then there is a vent that's right here uh, you'll need a flathead for that but it's kind of like the uh, soda pop straw right if you take your straw and you hold the top end and you can bring the uh, the pop up into the straw we're doing kind of the same thing here we're going to open that up Get everything in position and then we'll undo the, the vent here and it'll just start to flow out. I also find that if you can't quite get the angle you want having your oil pan underneath the lower unit, you can lower this a bit and uh, that might give you a better angle in which to put that pan underneath your skag and make everything fit a little better. And see, that fits really, really well under the skag. So here we are getting ready to undo. This little guy. Now when you take this out, be really careful because there's a small yellow gasket I'll show that that's going to come off with this or it may be stuck. We'll see what happens here. And you'll either need to replace or reuse that. You see it there, it's stuck to the bottom of this. That's okay.
looks like that. And uh, there's varying opinions. Some will say it's cheap insurance, replace it every time. They're not that expensive, and this is true. Some people say, ah, you know what, I can get a couple seasons out of this, and it's uh, in perfectly good shape, and uh, there's nothing wrong with it. So it'll depend, uh, you know, what you want to do for your particular boat. I've done it both ways. I'm going to put that off to the side. And here's that vent drain. And once you undo this, you should see your lower unit start to drain a little bit more freely. And this too, there it is, it's stuck there, also has one of those little yellow gaskets. And same thing applies there, either Reuse it, it's in good shape, or replace it, it's cheap insurance. And you can inspect what your fluid looks like as it comes out, things like metal shavings or what have you. This looks pretty good. It's kind of a dark blue when it goes in. I'll show you that as you refill it. You know, coming out, it's, uh, you know, got a little bit of a blue hue to it still, but it's pretty dark. And, you know, I'm putting between, you know, 50 and... 80 some hours in and a season so I expect it to be worn but nothing here that looks out of the ordinary well that's doing its thing we're going to go ahead and start draining the engine oil on the starboard side this is your oil drain we're going to crack this loose with a 5 8 wrench and then we're going to stick a 5 8 inch diameter hose on here and we're going to begin to drain that so I'll show you that in a second Here's our 5 eighths ratchet, and we're just going to get it on here and just start it, like that. No more than that, because this is going to start draining if you do more than that, and it's going to get all over where you don't want it. So just start it just like we did. Have your 5 eighths diameter hose ready. And mine's got a little bit of memory in it, I've got to work out because it's been coiled up the last year. And you just want to press this into that oil drain. And yet, it sometimes takes a second. There we go. Get it in there good. And now that you've got it in there, now begin to finish loosening this up. Of course, mining where the other end of your hose is at. And there it comes, and they will tell you no more than two and a half turns on this because there's a seal there that you may damage if you go more than two and a half turns. And then it just becomes a matter of keeping your hose in a spot where you want it. This might be easier, and I've done it going into like an old, uh, you know, milk jug or something. It keeps the hose planted a little bit better, but that'll be up to you how you want to do that. Now, depending on your motor, and this is entirely up to you, you may not need it at all, but you can open up your oil fill a little bit here to encourage it to flow a little faster. It may do something for you. It may not. I'm indoors in a garage. I'm not worried about leaves or anything falling in there, but uh, something you can consider doing. So while all that's draining, let's talk about the oil filter. It's right here uh, on the starboard side. This is your dipstick and anything that's yellow is going to be a maintenance item here so there's a dipstick here there's a drain here now this is a trough that sits under the oil filter so if you open this there may be a little bit of oil inside of it it'll catch in this trough and then you could hook up a small hose to this i, I don't remember it might be quarter inch or something that will uh, allow you to drain that outside of your cowling it doesn't get inside your cowling and make a mess and then there's a low pressure 
uh, fuel filter I'll talk about here in a little bit. So we're gonna go ahead and loosen this oil filter up. I use an oil filter wrench, something that looks like this. There's many different types of wrenches that are out there. You can use one that works for you. And it shouldn't be on there terribly tight. There we go. Once you get it started, it should just come off like this. And then if you want to have some shop towels handy or you want to use that trough, that'll be up to you. Here we go. Now pay attention. This needs to look silver, just like it does. Sometimes this gasket will come off the oil filter, just like this, and it'll stick right here. This happened once, so learn from my mistake. This may stick, and it'll be there. It'll be black on black. You won't realize that it's there. And then what'll happen is you'll screw another oil filter that has another gasket on there, and you'll, you'll be double gasketed and it won't make a good seal and it'll be leaking oil all over the place. And it'll be a really bad day if you're time out in the water. So check and make sure that your seal is not stuck here. Clean it up just a little bit. It looks pretty good. I find that the trough that I mentioned a moment ago is a really, really great idea. Uh, I haven't been in a spot where I really needed to use it all that much, but cleaned it up real nice. And if you get any in that trough, you can, of course, run their towel in there and clean it up or, or drain it. So I got a little bit, but not much. Okay, get your new filter ready. This is the part number there from Mercury. You can just look at beyond the 35 dash. It may have a a Q at the end, that'll be the quick silver, quick silver version of this. I'm an idiot. I put the date on there just so I can see when I change that filter last. And don't forget to take the plastic off. What I'll do is I'll take some of the old oil and I will put a little bit on that gasket. It makes taking this off a season from now uh, a lot easier. Run a little bit in there. Doesn't take much. You'll need to wash your hands when you're done. You're going to do that anyway. And just do that. You could put a little more, a little less. That'll be up to you. Now, I like to put this on hand tight, really as tight as I can. And that wrench really only goes one way, so... That's pretty much it. If you want to take that wrench and try to give a little extra, you can, but that should be sufficient. Once your hose is clear, looks like this, you can remove it and tighten that back up. This actually drained pretty quickly, you know, in a handful of minutes. And oh, by the way, that lower unit is still draining ever so slightly. Don't over tighten it, it's all it needs. All right, so coming up here and using whatever your funnel of choice is, you can start to add your oil. A reminder for this 150 Pro XS, uh, we're talking six quarts. And with a nice big funnel like this, you can generally get things done pretty quick.
All right, once you've filled and you've given it a few moments to kind of settle in, you can take your dipstick here, give it a good wipe. And check the level. It looks like I am, hopefully the camera's picking it up, right in the middle where I should be. So it's perfect. Once we're done with the oil, you can put the cap back on top and clean up any messes you may have made. And next we're going to change the inline filter. Now on this 150, it is buried down there quite a bit, but they do give you this yellow pull handle, which is really easy to reach to pull that out. Now on my last motor, which was again a Merc 90, that inline filter was right here. It was really easy to reach. It just had a little clip you had to pull out of it and you can change it out. This one. Like I said, is is down a little bit, but you can get in there with the your fingers well enough, and uh, and just pull on this handle here, just like that, and then you can pull this up, and then you can get to your filter there. All right, so pulling it out, it should look like this. Sorry, I had a little hard time doing it with the uh, camera in my hand, but it's it's really easy to get out. And uh, there's a couple of red tabs. There's one here, one on the bottom. And uh, so all you gotta do is push that little red tab in. You'll hear it click. That hose comes out. You might leak a little fuel, that's okay. You can clean up with a rag. Move that out of the way. Take your handle. You can put that off to the side for a moment. And the same thing, pull this little uh, red guy down here in the bottom, and this pops out. Again, you might get a little fuel. That's okay. You clean it up. Um, just note the uh, orientation here is this way as I'm leaking some gas out. I'll drop that into the uh, oil pan there. This is the part number this happens to be the quicksilver version of it so again it's got a q at the end instead of a k but the middle numbers is what you need if you want to get this from either mercury marine or quicksilver it's the same part there are other generics that are a little bit less expensive um i'm sure they're probably just fine but um you know use at your own risk and there you go, all put back together. Again, I've got my idiot date on there just in case I forget what I did. And it's just a matter of putting this back down into the compartment um, basically until it snaps into place. And as good of a design as this is, you do have to get past this linkage here, which is a little bit of pain, but it's really no big deal. It's pretty easy to get in and out. Well, our lower unit has finally finished emptying itself. I use this high performance gear lube uh, from Mercury or Quicksilver. They make a kind of a standard gear lube, but if you guys remember what it looked like when I was draining it, it was pretty used. I do spend two to three weeks up north in Canada, and uh, when I'm up there, it runs pretty hard, so I do tend to use the better stuff if I can get it. It does cost a few dollars more. Um, to get the high performance than the standard gear loop, but uh, I think for me, you know, it's worth it. And then you'll need to have a pump that looks like this. It just sits in and screws onto the top of the quart. And then there is a threaded end that goes into where we took out our bolt earlier, and it just threads in. You'll have to kind of monkey with the with the hose a little bit uh, to get it in there, but it just threads in there. And then it's just a matter of pumping 
and that cavity in there in the lower unit will fill. You want to leave the vent open until it really starts to run over. So this whole thing is going to fill as you pump it up. It's going to fill, 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 and then once it gets to the vent, it'll spill over. And that'll tell you that you're full. And at that point, you can put that um, vent plug with a washer back in. All right, then you just have to unthread this guy and you may have to work the hose a little bit to work with you. There's the threader portion I was talking about a moment ago. Put that off to the side. You take your rag and you can clean it up a little bit if you want. Take our plug with a new washer and we're just going to start that by hand. As you saw, only a few drops came out because that vent plug is in there, keeping this from making a mess all over the place. And once we get that thread most of the way on, we can take our 10 millimeter and we can tighten that all the way up. Find its mark there and nice and snug, no need to over tighten. Moving on to spark plugs, this is an inline four cylinder, so we've got one, two, three, and four. Uh, all the plugs and plug wires are pretty easy to get to, except for this bottom was a little bit of a pain, but nothing that's too terrible. If we look at the placard here on the side, it will say that we need to pull and at a minimum inspect as part of the cycle. The boots just pull out like that. Uh, if I'm going to take the time to pull these out and take a look, uh, I might as well just take them out and replace them. You may need a, looks like a longer extension than what I have here. Now, if you've got these to the proper torque specs, it shouldn't be terrible to get out. But I'm going to show you what one of these looks like. Again, after we're not even at 100 hours, I think we're only at about you know, 60 hours or something for the season. But you can see a little bit of carbon wear there, nothing terrible. Certainly reusable. Like I said, you could check that gap and you can, um, you know, clean those up a little bit and get probably another, you know, one or two seasons out of them. I've done that in the past. There's nothing wrong with it. This is the NGK plug that comes from the factory and what we're going to put back into it. There's your part number. This works on a lot of different Mercury Marine motors. And here's what they... A new plug looks like right other than some carbon right not terrible I have found that let me do this if you got a uh, a plug socket that uh, with a little rubber booty in there that sometimes helps but it's not needed but I was just saying I found that by putting new plugs in, uh, I do maintain that highest performance level. I find when I don't do this to the plugs, sometimes I, you know, lose that mile an hour or so when I do it. 
So I just have it snugged in there now. We can come back and we can torque the specification here in a little bit. And this bottom one that I am not going to get on camera, I'm not going to lie, it's um, it's kind of a pain. I, I love what Mercury did. I like the design. Um, but yeah, I wish their Kylie cover came just a little lower because this sucks. <laughs> There it is. And this is just me trying to get a camera angle in there. But yeah, we're all the way, if I can get it to focus a little better, we're all the way down there. Again, doable, but a pain. All right, and then once you get that knuckle buster done, all the boots are back in place. You are now done with your plugs. Next thing to check are your anodes, sometimes referred to as sacrificial anodes, and they're just that. They're these pieces of material here. They're mostly made of zinc, I think, but there's a few other things in them. And basically what happens is when your boat's in the water, you know, there's a natural current that's in the water and just, you know, being water, it will eat away at these instead of eating away at your hull and your lower unit. So this particular boat has three of them. There's one here, there's one on the exact opposite side that cover the motor. And even though this is really up here under the, the uh, power or the um, hydraulics down here, uh, there's a big one that's down here that covers the boat. So this is only the end of the second season here. So my anodes are in pretty good shape still. I should get a lot of years out of these, but if you see these and they're getting to be, you know, worn away, you know, or, or kind of really flaking off pretty good, um, replace these because, again, it'll eat away at these instead of your hull and your motor. All right, we've got a couple of lube points that we're going to talk about here. So I've got my handy-dandy grease gun, and you see I have it on a Zerk here, and I'm just going to apply a little bit of grease uh, and that's going to cover this rail here um, and I have one zerk on this side I have one on the exact opposite side and then there's also one let's see if I can get the camera up in here up underneath the the shaft here it's there I don't know if the camera's picking it up all right really before we finish up the motor here and move on to the uh rest of the boat, we can just put our prop back on. You can skip this till the end of the season, or pardon me, the beginning of next season if you want. A little bit of uh, new marine grease here. Doesn't need to be scientific. Get it on there. Rust washer. This is the Mercury Tempest Plus. Uh, which is a fantastic prop for this 150. Washer for your prop nut and the prop nut. And it's really just 
putting it back together the way you had it. And don't forget to get your tab snug against the prop nut here. I use a pair of channel locks. Some people use a flathead screwdriver, but get the, those tabs on there nice and snug. We've got the cowling back on. Now, if you wanted to, you could take this outside and flush the engine. Mercury gives a port here to hook up a garden hose by just pulling this out and removing this kind of dust cap here. You hook up a garden hose here, turn on your spigot, and it'll flush out the bottom half of the engine. Uh, if you're in salt water, you probably want to do that much more often. If you're in fresh water like me, uh, really just do it as needed. And then you can close it back up and put it away when you're done. Just like that. Now, depending on your Mercury model and or year, Mercury will say in some instances at idle, you can use that garden hose connection to run your engine. Other years, another model will say, yeah, don't even bother doing that. Just use the muffs like you normally would to run your engine, uh, you know, if you want to use something in the driveway. So look at your manual. Next up on the agenda is talking about trailers. Now, you hear these stories on the interwebs or uh, some of the other YouTube channels that are out there. Boneheaded Boaters of the Week, Googans of the Week. Thank you, Broncos Guru. You got a great channel. Uh, you know, the story is a uh, person's got a nice looking boat, great looking boat, didn't take care of the trailer, didn't do the maintenance, and their story lives forever on the interwebs. So uh, moral of the story here, take care of your trailer, do the maintenance, and we'll show you how to do that next. So we're gonna start this with looking at the tires. This is gonna be some really obvious stuff, but I think somebody watching this video needs to hear it. So check your tread. Uh, make sure your depth feels good. Uh, inspect for signs of wear, bulges, you've got some belts exposed, things like that. Um, you got those things, do yourself a favor, replace the tire. I know you may not want the expense, but that comes with owning a boat and a trailer. Um, next thing, check your tire pressure, just like on your car. There is a recommended tire pressure for Your trailer tire. In this particular case, mine is cold tire pressure of 50 psi. Cold tire pressure basically means check it with the trailer not being active at ambient temperature. At least that's the way I look at it. So we're in October, Wisconsin. It's in the 50s. It should be somewhere around 50 degrees, give or take a couple of pounds, depending on what your temperature swings are. When you drive down the road with your tow vehicle, towing your trailer, your tires will heat up a little bit. Some road friction making turns, uh, you've got trailer brakes. This one's got a surge brake on, looks like this axle here. Uh, you know, it'll warm up a few degrees, right? So that's normal, that's, that's built into the equation, right? I should have this filled up to roughly 50 pounds in my case. If you have a spare tire, make sure that spare tire is filled up to, again, the recommended tire pressure. There's nothing like chaining a flat with a flat. It doesn't work. If you don't have a spare, go get one. There's nothing like having a flat and you don't have a spare. Now you have to unhook your trailer from your tow vehicle and uh, leave it somewhere on the side of the road so you can go try to find a store that has your tire and come back and try to install it. Get a spare if you don't have one. Okay, so that's tires. Let's look at hubs. Now I've got bearing buddies on mine. They have these little um, dust covers on them. And I have a Zerk that's in here, which is my access point. So I recently greased mine, but just to demonstrate, I'm going to put my grease gun on the Zerk here. Just like that. 
give it a couple of wax of grease. This is going to expand out to a point, and then you're good to go. I know bearing buddies, people either love them or they hate them, but whatever your axle hub system is, make sure you check the grease on them. There's a few different styles that are out there. Do it on all of your tires. Okay, lastly, for me, and this isn't, I don't think recommend it anywhere. Lastly, for me, I go through once a season, maybe once every other season, you can get away with it, depending on how much you travel. I will go through and I will crack all of those lugs. And I'll take them off. I'll either put a little anti-seize on the, on the stud or just some white lithium grease and put them back on. Why would I do this? Well, funny you ask. Some years ago, I was traveling with a family member's boat and they hadn't done that many, many, many years. And we had an unfortunate blowout on the highway and I couldn't get the lugs off and I was cracking the studs off, right? So I ended up going home with just two studs, um, which I don't recommend. Uh, so getting home really, really cautiously um, because, you know, we didn't, we didn't check these. When you put them back on, get your torque wrench, make sure they're torqued down at a correct specification. Okay, um, in my case, it's 90 foot pounds, so check them. I do that at least once a year, and you know, you shouldn't have any problems. One last thing I didn't mention as you're going through and you're checking your tread um, look at uneven wear. So, if you got the inside or the outside that's wearing unevenly, that sometimes is a tell that you have an axle that's out of alignment or you have an axle that's bent and you need to get that fixed because it's just going to cause uh, excessive wear your tires or you may even have a blowout because this will be slightly out of line and it's just going to wear and finally it's just going to pop and, and again it'll be a really really bad day. This is more of a recommendation than a maintenance item but if you're in a state that requires a license plate Wisconsin is one of those we'll say half states uh, if you're under a certain weight, uh, they leave you alone. If you're over a certain weight, and this boat and trailer is, they make you put one on. So what I'll say is a lot of times these Shorelander trailers, I'm sure other brands as well, uh, will give you a plastic license plate um, bracket. And, you know, you would mount your plate directly to that. And if you do any amount of traveling of any distance, you will know if you have a setup like this where your plate's kind of, behind your tire, even though you got a little bit of a lip here, that when you arrive at your destination, your plate is not up and down like this. Your plate's probably <laughs> kind of like that, right? Some rocks will come up and hit it and just knocked it and bent it to crap. And then, you know, you end up with a cracked uh, bracket. So replace it with a metal bracket. It's a lot more rigid. And then in this case, this is also a metal license plate frame. Uh, this is really designed to go on to uh, let's say a back of a van or something that, that maybe doesn't have a, a place to put a plate or maybe a new bumper or something that doesn't have a place to put a plate. So metal bracket, you can get these at some of your auto parts stores. I think I got this one on Amazon. And it's metal. And since I've had this on the last couple of seasons and I've done uh, a couple trips up to Canada, I think three trips up to Canada from Wisconsin. So, you know, that's 12, 1300 mile round trip. I have not had a bend issue with my plate so just a just an idea for you guys this is also a good opportunity to inspect your safety chain and strap and bow roller if you want to add a little bit of a wd to some of the points here on your stand as well as your pins. If you have a swing away trailer like this one, check your pins. I have an aftermarket one here because I like this better with this little grip that's on here. If you have brakes, your brake hose, make sure you haven't pinched any of your trailer wires while opening and closing your tongue here because that sometimes happens. And of course your tow chains and connections for your truck. All right, so we're in the truck for a moment, and what we're gonna do is test our trailer lights. Now GM's got an app built into some of the newer trucks where it'll run a light sequence, 
and you can go through and you can test to make sure that your lights are working without having a second person. So let's go and do that. Got marker lights, got marker lights, and then the obvious here, if you have something that needs to be replaced, go ahead and replace. So brake light, turn signal, if I go to the other side, I should see the other signal. And that'll of course match whatever the truck's doing there. Pretty straightforward. All right, we've done the motor, we've done the trailer, and next is to start talking about the boat itself. One of the first things you can do to make your boat look good and uh, make it last is to clean it. And you can look at my windshield there, it's absolutely filthy. Uh, as we're getting to the fall months here, not being used as much, so it's sitting in the garage a little more, unfortunately. And just from the last time I used it, it needs a little cleaning. So I like Meguiar's products here, uh, but everyone's gonna have their uh, favorite cleaner, you know, quickie sauce, hot sauce, whatever that happens to be for you. And believe it or not, for the windows, I like the rain -X quite a bit. It lets your water um, beat a little bit. Now, I put the regular rain -X on there as well, but this helps refresh that rain -X on the windows and it keeps it pretty clean at the same time. This would also be a good time to do maintenance on your trolling motor. I'm gonna save the full maintenance for a separate video because it's really Old video on its own. This one happens to be a Minn Kota Altera. So if you know, you know. <laughs> but it's really been a good motor overall. But whatever your maintenance for your trolling motor looks like, now's a good time to do it. Now I've got this really awesome marine mat. Some of you guys may have this. Some of you guys maybe have a snap and carpet. You know, whatever that might be for you. Uh, this is a good time if you haven't done so already, and depending on how your season's going, maybe you got to do it a couple times. But to pull your snaps up, and what I find is sometimes, depending on the environment I'm in, I'll have some water that's kind of pulled in a few spots down here. Now, this is, I'm not sure what you call that, right? It's got a you know material on there that kind of keeps us raised. And uh, you know allows it to breathe a little bit, but nevertheless, uh, I've had a few spots where water collects. And oh, this is the vinyl floor underneath. It's really just plywood underneath that vinyl. And uh, you know you can get mold, you can get rot, you can get all kinds of things you don't want. So if you've got something like this, uh, you know remember to take it up every now and then and make sure everything's nice and dry. Additionally, I'll go through all of my various compartments here. And again, if you haven't done this already, I will begin to empty out different areas and make sure that all is dry below. Again, just avoiding uh, moisture and mold and things you don't want in your boat. Now, cleaning is yeah, it's making the boat look nice and, you know, some of us are a little bit more over the top with it than than others. But um, part of it also is that, hey, come spring, when the new season starts, <laughs> it's going to be sitting. It's going to be have some dust and things on it. I'm going to be cleaning it again. But it also gives me the opportunity to kind of check things and, hey, I didn't recognize or, hey, when did that happen? Or, hey, that's kind of loose. I need to fix that. So cleaning is not always about just making it look nice, although it certainly does that. It uh, you know, gives you the chance to really check your boat over and see what she needs. All right, so we're at the local gas station and uh, we're gonna talk about fuel. 
and so everyone's going to have their fuel additive or fuel stabilizer of choice this year it's going to be seafoam and uh, but again everyone's going to have a different thing on there now this engine will run on 87 all day long but 91 no ethanol uh one's a little better my opinion uh, again you do whatever your boat requires um, even if the 91 non-ethanol doesn't necessarily need uh, the seafoam, uh, screw it. I'm putting it anyway. That's just <laughs> how I'm going to do it. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. And hopefully without spilling a bunch of it, you, know, you might get a few drabs or you got to clean up. Uh, go ahead and just dump her over and top her in there. And then after I add this, I go ahead and fill her up. So for me, it's important to fill the tank up at the end of the season. That helps keep the moisture and stuff out of the tank that may, you know, condense and do different things and then give you uh, the fits when you're trying to stretch your motor, you know, come the spring. Once you fill her up, it'll be up to you whether you want to run some of that fuel stabilizer through the engine. Not a bad idea if you haven't done so already or if you want to run some through the engine and then disconnect the fuel and then run the fuel out of the engine, again, that'll be really up to you. Next up is talking about some of the electronics. Now this happens to be a Helix 15 that I installed a custom mount on and uh, it's pretty cool. But I actually clean this and then I take it off the mount and I bring it inside. Uh, for the winter, even though my garage is attached and it's, you know, got some level of climate control in here, it's got a heater, it still gets pretty cold in here in some of the coldest months here in Wisconsin. So uh, to clean it, I know I showed some detergents earlier, or some cleaners rather, uh, with this. I use something a little different. This is uh, a mix of water and vinegar, uh, equal parts, and a little spray bottle, and uh, just a little bit on there is all it needs. Take a soft rag and you can spray it directly on the screen or you can spray it on the rag, it's up to you. And yet it's got a little bit of that vinegar smell to it, but uh, it gets all the water spots off it and uh, you know, it's not gonna hurt it. And then once I get her clean up and let her dry, I'll put the uh, cover on and take her off, like I said. As we're talking about electronics, we're gonna talk about batteries. Now your boat, if you have one like this, you have at least one and you may have as many as five and they may be different types of batteries. But to start, you know, we're gonna check our connections. Of course, if you got a bad connection, you might know it already because stuff's gonna stop working. But things feel good, nothing there to worry about. Now, this is really kind of an inexpensive flooded lead acid battery. This is what the dealer put in here when I bought the boat. So we gotta check water levels. These just pop off. You can take a peek in there, and uh, looks like I could probably use just a touch of water in there. Add distilled water to it. And batteries are kind of funny because you're supposed to add water after a charge so they don't, you know, cook. Um, but you don't want to charge a battery with no water in it because you could burn up cells. So something you'll have to navigate when you do these. And then if you want to take these out, and put them on some kind of tender. If you store your boat outside or something like that, it's really cold, you may wanna do that, bring them inside, bring them into a garage. Uh, again, I'm in a garage, so I leave them here in the boat, and I have a Minn Kota three bank charger, which I will plug in periodically throughout the winter just to maintain a charge on them. Last but not least, live wells. Now, depending on where you store your boat and the position of your live wells, you may want to drop some antifreeze in there. Not so much to protect the tank, you want to keep that clean, but there's a drain, and that drain goes somewhere, usually somewhere underneath your floor. Now, this particular one, not a big deal. It goes from the floor out to the back of the boat behind the motor there. It's a pretty good drain. It The boat's on a little bit of a, of a pitch, uh, bow to stern. So I don't have to worry about any water getting stuck in that hose that goes from the drain out to the back, uh, at least for this particular boat. 
Now, on my previous boat, the live well was in the front, and that drain hose went all the way from the front all the way to the back. And you know what? Sometimes water was sitting there because it would go over some of the structure uh, or ribs of the boat, and uh, you know that would cause a problem. So I would put some regular, like, RV antifreeze that you would get for, like, a camper, right, a little bit in there. And then I would fill it to basically it, it drained out in the back. I had a little bucket back there. Uh, and that would protect you for the winter. You know, when it came uh, spring, I would just take a, you know, a garden hose, throw it in the live well, flush it all out, and be good to go before you put it in the water. All right, guys, thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. I know we covered a lot today, but honestly, once you do this a couple times and maybe do a couple of tasks at the same time, you could really knock all this out in like an afternoon. It's not a big deal. Um, again, this is how I do my boat. It's really kind of just the minimum. Uh, there's certainly a lot more you can do. You can go over things with a fine tooth comb and certain things that I miss. But again, this is what I do at my boat. So also remember it's all three, boat, motor, and trailer. Uh, don't just do the boat and neglect the trailer and, and back and forth, right? So um, again, thanks for watching the video. If you like this type of content, hit the like and the subscribe. We have all kinds of videos like this on the channel and uh, hope to see you next time.